introduction. Everybody, welcome to the Jean Monnet Center Montreal Winter 2021 Speaker Series. I'm Juliette Johnson. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Professor of Political Science at McGill and a member of the Center, and I'm moderating our Speaker Series this term, which is on the theme of Europe and memory. So our protocol for these talks is that we start with our speaker presentation, which is around 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions. And when we do the Q&A, please use the raise hand function to indicate that you want to ask a question and I'll moderate. And we'll end promptly at 10.25 a.m. Now today's talk, today's fabulous talk, I'm assuming, because I know Catherine. Today's talk by Catherine Liu is co-sponsored with the Yan P. Lin Center at McGill. Now, Catherine is professor of political science at McGill University, and she's the coordinator of the research group on global justice of the Jan P. Lin Center. Her research and teaching interests intersect political theory and international relations, and they focus on critical, historical, and normative studies of humanitarianism and interventionism in world politics. And as you can probably all hear, there's a horn going on outside telling us all to move our cars for the snow clearing. That does not take away from the fact that Catherine also studies structural injustice, global justice, alienation and reconciliation, uh, and cosmopolitanism and the world state. In addition to writing a lot of articles on these themes, she's the author of two excellent books. The first award-winning Justice and Reconciliation in World Politics from Cambridge University Press in 2017 and her first fascinating book, Just and Unjust Interventions in World Politics, Public and Private from 2006. So again, excited to have you with us, Catherine, excited to have our, 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 our fantastic audience and the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Juliette. It's a great pleasure to give a talk, uh, share some ideas uh, with the uh, members of the Jean Monnet Center in Montreal um, and on this fascinating topic of Europe and memory. So welcome to all. Thank you for, for getting up uh, early or late if in your, you're in Europe uh, to come hear this talk. All right, um, let me see. Ah, yes, wonderful. So I'm going to start by giving uh, a broad outline of the arguments that I'm trying to make in my paper. Uh, it, it uh, tries to look at what museums do and, and to try to understand what especially um, ethnographic and museums of culture or civilization or, or uh, the nation do. Um, you know, one very common way to think about such museums is, is that they are representational authorities and experts um, of, you know, whether it's the nation or Europe or civilization or humanity. Um, so museums claim to be representatives of humanity uh, and to be experts at doing so. Um, and, and I basically in my paper want to challenge this way of thinking about museums and, and their self-identification as representational authorities and experts. And instead I want to try to think about how museums are uh, custodians of material collections of narrative. So basically sort of like about the material culture of the ways that we identify ourselves, the ways that we place ourselves also uh, in, in humanity. And I argue that museums more often than not than in displaying these uh, identity narratives through material culture reveal the unfinished work of uh, legacies of empire, slavery, and colonialism. Uh, and I think, again, this is not really a very new or interesting point anymore, but I just want to point out that that you know, that this way of thinking about museums, uh, there, there, there are these two ways of thinking about museums and, and that, you know, they, they create obviously a lot of tension with each other. So um, I, I also then in the paper want to get at a bit more of, well, what is wrong with the museum's claim to represent humanity? You know, uh, they surely have all the artifacts often and they have experts uh, they, of various kinds. Uh, so, so what exactly is, is the problem with the claim? Um, and, and I, again, I want to argue that there are sort of two ways that we can think about what's wrong with museums. You know, one is focusing on the colonial origins of modern museums, of ethnography, history, civilization, and world culture. So some people would argue, well, uh, the way that these collections happened, you know, were, were through colonial conquest, uh, asymmetrical center periphery relations. Uh, so there's a sort of historic injustice component to the foundation, right, the origin story of museums, as I put it in my paper. 
Um, but I also want to disturb that a bit to say, well, that's, I don't think that's really what's driving the controversy about museums anymore. I mean, sure, it is part of it, but it's, it's also about how this historic injustice has become an, um, a perpetual reproducer of structural injustice in contemporary social relations. So I argue the, the real problem now, why, why we see all these controversies about these museums now, is about how they continue to reproduce colonial racialized hierarchies and center periphery dynamics of asymmetrical power. So it's really not that there's a, a historical injustice that has to be rectified so much as there's a contemporary injustice that museums, such museums uh, contribute to. And so the controversies that we see then, oh, and in my talk then I'll give a kind of outline of, of sort of two ways of thinking about uh, the, the wrong of, of uh, uh, misrepresentation by museums. And I, I, I attach it to this concept of alienation. So I, I say that museum exhibits uh, and, and museums themselves are, can be forms of alienation. Uh, and, and have to do with representative alienation. There's representative usurpation and there's representational misappropriation. There's sort of two different ways uh, of thinking about um, representational alienation that museums uh, enact through the way that they, uh, they either present material culture uh, or also just the way that, that they're constituted. Um, okay, and, and so then the paper moves on to talk about um, what the remedies are. So here, this is sort of the subtitle of the talk is to say, once we've diagnosed that the problem of museums is these ways of uh, representational alienation, what's the, what's the solution? And I argue, well, then we have to think about how to uh, change museums and their practices to try to forward these more anti-colonial and decolonial tasks. And, and we can think about them as in these two ways, as, as disalienation, um, and as non-alienation. So I'll, again, in, in my talk, I'll, I'll say more about these, these two things, uh, but to give you a brief like uh, um, uh, summary of it, um, practices of disalienation uh, means trying to uh, show how museums can resist or repudiate or shed or help its members and its audience shed these colonial subjectivities. Uh, and these are not only of those who are oppressed, but of, of those who are oppressors, um, or at least historically have been the oppressors. Uh, but we can also say from a structural injustice point of view that they continue to be uh, oppressors. And then the second way of thinking about redressing representational, representational alienation is, is through trying to cultivate non-alienation. So this, um, entails uh, really a, a pro I mean, I, I wanna say that non-alienation is actually a really difficult thing, right? So it's, it's not an easy thing. It's not just about diversity, for example, showing you know, all the world cultures sort of on an even footing now. Um, it, it actually entails the problem that in fact, uh, human history has been uh, you know, for a long time now, um, full of dispossession, slavery and genocide. So it's really about the possibility, it's trying to make some possibility out of the fact of these histories. Okay, all right, so that, that's a brief, I, not so brief upshot of, of the arguments I'm gonna be presenting. So to begin um, on the diagnosis part, uh, you know, when we go to the British Museum, which which I did when I lived in London for a year, uh, you know, when, when is also struck by the incredible claims that such museums make, you know, they, they certainly have been around for a long time. The British Museum was founded in 1753, uh, and it claims to be a museum of the world for the world, right? <clears throat> so right there in that little phrase, we can already see the two different kinds of representational claims about humanity, right? We, we are of the world and we are for the world. You know, we represent the world and we can represent the world. So there are, there are ways in which this phrase just basically says it all. And if you go to their website, you know, they, the Bridge Museum also prides itself on this diverse collection of over 8 million objects from across the globe, um, which it's willing to share on a loan basis to everybody else in the world. So they basically now say, well, if you are a small museum somewhere uh, in Ghana and might want to borrow some of these artifacts which might have come from your own people, um, we're willing to loan them to you. 
um, but not let you own them, of course. So we're not giving up anything, but but we're willing to loan them to you and, and do this kind of collaborative loaning thing. But, but th this collection is ours because of course, um, the British Museum claims to be the representative of humanity and to be an expert at, at doing so. Um, of course, the British Museum is not uh, uh, the only museum of, of its kind to do this. Uh, I also went to uh, Leiden and Amsterdam in 2019 when I started doing some of this research. Uh, and again, it's, it's striking about how museums have been fully aware. I, I, I want to stress that museums have not remained like static, uh, you know, representatives. Uh, they, they have they have actually evolved with world politics and have had several makeovers. Um, so when you look at the makeover of a museum like the Tropen Museum, you can see that it's it basically originated as a place to hold uh, artifacts brought back by by soldiers and and uh, traders from the Dutch overseas territories. Uh, and then it became a colonial museum, explicitly a colonial museum with, a, with an institute of research. Um, it moved to Amsterdam, which is actually where this picture is, is from. It's now in, in Amsterdam. Uh, and then of course, uh, after Indonesian independence, after World War II and all that, uh, there and, and the Holocaust, it, it became the, the Tropen Museum um, in 1950. And what's interesting is now when you read like the mission of, of, the, uh, of these museums like the Tropen Museum, uh, I'll just read a very brief uh, excerpt from its presentation of its uh, mission. It says, with overarching themes like love, mourning, celebration and conflict, they awaken our curiosity about the enormous cultural diversity that enriches the world. Um, this in turn allows us to uh, inspire an open attitude to the world and to help shape a global community. This is our mission. We are a museum about people. Okay, so what's fascinating, I think, about these makeovers is that uh, such museums have gone through a kind of no nominal transition from being a colonial museum to one that is about people. And this, of course, marks a clear break from the historic function of museums, especially in the 19th, or early 20th centuries, to represent human cultural differences according to a racialized hierarchy of civilization. Um, now, this, this representation of humanity as comprising a non-hierarchical diversity of cultures involved, uh, as Tony Bennett said, transformations of museum practices and policies designed to promote their use as civic institutions for fostering cross-cultural understanding and culturally diverse societies. So you can think about museums as playing a role, right, in, for example, the liberal multicultural politics of recognition. Now we recognize everyone equally and you know, we're going to display uh, all the objects that we have from everyone uh, as well. Um, and, but I think what's interesting is, you know, foundationally, we should also not forget that museums, although they, uh, they curate and conserve for humanity, at least they argue this, uh, and, and therefore seem to transcend the vagaries of international politics, um, in fact, modern museums continue to be structured as state agencies. So, for example, the Dutch state is the owner of national collections. And any um, recommendation for return or permanent transfer of ownership of cultural objects in the national co collection out of the custodianship of the museums has to have the assent of the Dutch state through the, the ministry and, and minister uh, of, of culture and, and education. So in other words, although this nominal change has happened, uh, we should understand that the relationship of museums to the state is still incredibly uh, strong and, and, and fixed, right? They're really like a, an appendage of, of the state. Okay, but as you know from recent controversies, uh, the, the way that museums have presented themselves has been subject to more and more uh, contestation. Uh, this is, you know, basically something that the British Museum did, uh, it looks like in August 2020, um, they took a statue of uh, Hans Sloan off its pedestal. Um, Sloan's, basically his collection 
uh, formed the basis of, of uh, the collection of, of three of the major institutions um, uh, in Britain, including the British Museum. Um, and, you know, as late as early 2020, there were curators from the British Museum who still portrayed Sloan as, um, as a great uh, gift to civilization because he created this encyclopedic connect collection that was left to the nation and that it was one of the greatest acts of civic humanism um, in the enlightenment. Um, now, of course, why did they move the statue of Hans Sloan? Well, you know, just in brief, um, I think if you're interested in, in Hans Sloan, you can read this great uh, book by the historian James Del Borgo, Collecting the World, uh, you know, in which he basically lays out how uh, Sloan uh, was able to do a lot of his collections um, uh, in Jamaica, partly uh, because he was uh, the personal physician to the Duke of Albemarle, who was the colonial governor of Jamaica, um, and also that he, he treated um, enslaved Africans, uh, often coming up with treatments to make these workers less lazy, um, and also that he was able to um, have the material ability to, to have his collections because he also had a third of his income from his marriage to Elizabeth Langley Rose, uh, from her plantations and her human property, which became his. Um, so, you know, again, there, there, and, and also that, that a lot of the collections he did of, of for example, natural history came from uh, local Indian and African assistants who helped him basically get the samples and, and perhaps even just got the samples themselves. Um, so all of this history is, is now uh, kind of acknowledged by the British Museum. You know, they have podcasts on it um, and there are books on it. Uh, and all they did was they moved the statue like, into a case where this history is contextualized in a display case, basically. <laughs> and yet there was a huge controversy about erasing history, you know, by, by taking the statue uh, off, off its pedestal. Okay. Um, now, in the paper, I, I argue, so, so, you know, obviously, when we look at the, the history of, of collections, we can see a lot of its uh, colonial imperial origins. Uh, but I also want to argue that, that with these actual practices of colonialism and imperialism, you also had uh, theoretical developments, right? So you had theorists who, who also uh, conceptualized humanity in ways that, uh, that, that made, um, you know, this, this continued kind of relation uh, more possible in people's imaginations. Uh, and, and here, you know, I, I just uh, talk about one of the major thinkers of the Enlightenment, uh, someone that we usually associate with uh, cosmopolitanism. And in contemporary cosmopolitanism, of course, we, we think of Kant uh, as uh, someone who uh, was a, a champion of uh, autonomy, uh, also someone who thought that universal reason uh, was going to help us imagine a, a community of human beings uh, who would be able to perhaps form a world federation or world republic uh, of, of freedom. And Kant, in his theories, had this argument that, that it's a kind of part of human nature that we have this unsocial sociability um, and through conflict, you know, we actually can move towards a more governed, more law governed, sort of mutually respectful organization uh, of society. So Kant had this argument that human nature was such that through uh, conflict with others, we could basically achieve progress uh, in uh, recognizing each other as, as, uh, as capable of reason and therefore uh, having uh, developing social relations um, beyond our, even beyond our own societies in, in ways that, that would support cosmopolitan aspirations. So Kant was kind of unique, or I don't want to say unique, but certainly he, he was somebody who, you know, confronted with the fact of pluralism in his time, seeing that there were many different ways that human beings could organize themselves. He held out on this idea that there could be uh, after a number of structural revolutions, a universal cosmopolitan condition in which the original predispositions of the human species could be developed. So this is kind of the, the Kant that, that you know, we often teach and, and we know very well about uh, as part of the Enlightenment. Um, um, 
and and yet of course what is also known about cans more and more and which is taught more and more but not as much um is the fact that that cans also um you know builds on uh theories to to theorize race to theorize racial hierarchy um you know fascinatingly for a man who literally never left his little town and probably didn't even see the baltic sea which was only a few miles away from his home um he relied on a lot of like reports from other people who had gone gone away and but again these were obviously very problematic reports um but he also then had a kind of stadial theory of, of uh, racial hierarchies. Um, again, how was this reconcilable with his account of universal reason? I mean, he had a very complicated theory I'm not gonna go into about sort of germs and dispositions and how certain climates trigger certain developments and then they become sort of more entrenched. Uh, so it's, it's not that people are, are born necessarily with limits on how much they can develop, um, but, you know, due to a whole conjunction of factors, certain things, you know, certain germs don't get triggered in the right way and, 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 and so on. Um, but, but you can see that, that you know, in, in, in Kant, you have this, this argument uh, about racial inequality, about, about white supremacy, really. Um, and, of course, Kant later on becomes anti-colonial. What's fascinating is by the time he writes Perpetual Peace in 1795, He's uh, against the the European states uh, fighting each other in the colonies, in the Spice Islands, and, and so on. But his main reason um, is that this actually prevents the moral development of Europeans and their character. So, you know, on the one hand, he does care about, yes, that people are being mistreated um, in these non-European parts, but mainly he sees these wars as vicious for the development and the moral progress of Europeans. So in that sense, he becomes anti-colonial. Okay, um, I have to move along, I think. <laughs> so, so when I talk about then museums uh, as institutions of representation, I just want to clarify then sort of the two ways in which museums could be seen as institutions of representation. I, I think interestingly, and there might be work done on this already, but I'm just starting to, you know, or at least I did in 2019, start to think about this. Um, trying to apply some democratic theories of representation to museums to think about, you know, the ways in which uh, uh, they produce alienating representation. So one way is to think about representation as uh, museums being representatives or acting for uh, different groups in the world. So, so the problem for museums like the British Museum that claims to be of the world and acting in a way of the for for these diverse cultures is, you know, who what makes their representation legitimate, right? Like who elected them, right? Or who who said that they should be the agent or representative culture of this culture or of humanity? Um, what was the process by which they came to be the legitimate representative, right? That's a very common question to ask with respect to political representation, but we don't often ask. That with respect to cultural representation, although I think now increasingly uh, we do. Um, and then the second way of thinking about representation is with respect to uh, how it portrays, uh, how it actually represents cultures of the world. So, so here the question has to do with uh, how appropriate is the representation? It, it, what makes a representation of a culture or humanity good? Um, and with some recognition that what a culture is, is partly shaped by how it is represented uh, or portrayed, right? So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about appropriative agency, but again, there's a question of, you know, whose appropriative agency matters in portraying a culture, right? Should it be portrayed from a certain perspective and, and whose perspective should it be portrayed from? Okay, so from these two ways of thinking about representation, uh, I argue in the paper that we can think about one way of, one form of representation that is alienating uh, basically amounts to a kind of usurpation, right? So uh, the idea that um, when, when museums claim that they're representatives, oops, okay, uh, of, of uh, humanity or of, of different cultures, uh, we can ask about who made these museums the representatives. Uh, and we can also see that, that there is um, a lot of alien control, right, of uh, cultural artifacts, um, especially from colonial holdings, and, and that we can see this alien control as a form of domination or, or usurpation. Right. So these are people who are acting on behalf of a group 
uh, or a culture which uh, you know is is alien. Um, and and this I think we can see from the provenance of some museum holdings. There the way that these museums uh, acquired collections through colonial war and conquest. A very famous example that is now being worked on by a, by a group of states um, is the Benin bronzes uh, that came out of the military expedition uh, uh, in 1897. So one could argue that, you know, just the continued retention of such objects is a form of alienating control or representative uh, usurpation. Um, a second way to the second form of representation leads to this idea of cultural misappropriation. So here it has to do with um, problems of inhibiting the self-realization of, of those who are participants of a culture. And it can also have to do then with, for example, how is a certain culture portrayed in a certain story about humanity, right? So if it's portrayed in a kind of stadial theory of civilization, uh, going from primitive cultures and backward traditions to more advanced, uh, developed, you know, civilizations, right? That sort of stadial theory of civilization uh, is also a, a representation that that is a kind of misappropriation. Um, so it can't. This kind of uh, alienation involves sometimes practices of assimilation of the colonized into the worldview of the colonizer. Um, and again, you know, modern museums have. Uh, contributed to this. And so here, alienating representations somehow deny or inhibit or distort the appropriative agency of those who are colonized, and so frustrates their self-realization um, in, in the social world. Um, and in the paper, I, I have a lot of theoretical background about where these uh, ideas come from, but I'm not going to go through them so much uh, in, in this talk. Um, I, I put this poster up, uh, or this picture of, of this uh, Picasso exhibit that happened at the Musée de Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac uh, in Paris. Um, interestingly, this exhibit came to Quebec and lost the title. <laughs> but, you know, but the title itself already, I mean, there is primitivism in art, but it's fascinating that this is also now used in, in this exhibit to say here are the African art influences uh, of Picasso, right? But but just that word itself is, is obviously, uh, again, um, could be seen as, as problematic given that it uh, makes African culture sound like it was something that happened, you know, back in a previous time, uh, and also that it is somehow underdeveloped, right, that, that Picasso is the one who is developed and, and uh, took it, you know. Um, okay. So, so given these kinds of problems of representational alienation, you know, what, what do we do? And, and I, you know, I, I think uh, Aimé Césaire uh, already raised this in, in 1950. He even mentions the Benin bronzes uh, and, and he makes this, you know, very provocative statement that, that in, instead of, you know, collecting these objects after they've uh, uh, mutilated um, civilizations, you know, he argues that, that it would have been better to have, to have left uh, these societies uh, to go along their own way. And he also makes them this critique of museums uh, that they cultivate the smug self-satisfaction among Europeans, as well as a secret contempt for others, a racism that dries up sympathy and feeds the delights of vanity. Very powerful stuff. I actually just got a book um, by Dan Hicks called Brutish Museums, which is basically about, uh, I think, the Benin bronzes. Um, and what's uh, fascinating is he actually has like this quote as, at the beginning of his uh, of his book. So I probably will not be able to <laughs> use it at the beginning of my paper anymore. But but you know, but it is like a very clear uh, problem uh, about museums. So so should these museums even exist? Uh, should they be abolished? Uh, is that the way forward to uh, to emancipation? Um, well. I want to say that, you know, I, ha I haven't done all the research on this topic, so I don't know what the answer is, but I, I do want to say, well, it's possible that, you know, museums can try to at least redress the kinds of representational alienation that currently uh, uh, um, are, are part of the, the way that, that people have criticized them. So I, I try to then think through in this paper sort of two ways that museums can aid uh, anti-colonial and decolonial tasks. So my, you know, I hope it's been clear that one of my central arguments is that the makeovers that museums have had have skipped over a step, 
it's like uh, they went from colonial museums to you know museums about people without the middle part which was to get rid of the previous you know colonial constructions uh, of, of themselves and 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 so in that sense the anti-colonial and decolonial tasks had I think need to be done before they aspire to become just um, collections about you know about a diversity of peoples um, and this alienation, of course, is a term that that uh, we can attribute to to Franz Fanon, um, in which you know he basically is talking about at the very end of his book, Black Skin, White Masks, this this idea of um, of a genuine communication, and and he's arguing really that you know uh, through colonialism, the subjectivity of the oppressed and the oppressors have been distorted to such an extent that it's not possible for them really to have a genuine communication. So he says, before embarking on a positive voice, freedom needs to make an effort at this alienation, by which he means like destroying the kind of colonial subjectivities of, of both the oppressed and the oppressor. You know, what Césaire was talking about with respect to uh, those who think that their culture is uh, the, the best and, and uh, most civilized, as well as those who have an inferiority complex uh, through colonialism, as I discussed. Um, in, in my paper. So the question, the really big open question then is whether museums can be these spaces for these struggles, uh, whether museums can, um, can assist in um, developing uh, presentations that uh, of the self, of the nation, of Europe, uh, of civilization in ways that uh, disalienate people, uh, the audience um, from their attachments to their colonial subjectivities. Um, now, one way that I think museums, you know, have been trying to do this is, for example, uh, to return uh, objects, and, and this is just uh, to give you some idea of, of how the uh, some of the Dutch museums have been trying to do this. They they have tried to deal with um, uh, how they can transfer either permanently uh, or temporarily um, objects in their collections. So there are, you know, now sort of policies for the return of cultural objects. Um, now, again, the, the problem with a lot of these policies uh, is just how much uh, provenance has to be known. Uh, also, you know, there has to be like a huge record of, you know, where things were gotten. So again, this is sometimes not possible. Also, a, a lot of um, transfer of objects that, that happened uh, sometimes through market relations uh, were not necessarily coerced or taken through military exploits, but they were taken in uh, certain conditions of asymmetrical power relations. So again, you know, there's going to be limits to, to what these kinds of, um, I think, policies can produce. And we can see that already in, in the case of France, right, where France is just re very recently, I think, um, like maybe last month, uh, got, you know, allowed for some 26 or 27 objects to be returned to, I think, Senegal and, uh, and another country. But, uh, but again, like, I think Macron basically is, is moving towards a more case by case ad hoc basis for doing it. Uh, but it's 26 or 27 objects out of, you know, thousands that, that, um, that uh, France has. Um, okay, so, but but you know, I think this move towards critical custodianship is important. It's, it's something actually I, I sort of developed this idea of critical custodianship because when I went to uh, Leiden and I was informed that museums were custodians, I thought, okay, they're custodians. They have to work with uh, the state. But you know, how do they work with the state? You know, they, they could also try to be more critical of, of the state and they could try to be more proactive in implementing or suggesting certain kinds of policies. And so I, I think you know, this is an example of uh, museums trying to be more critical in the way that they act as custodians um, but are limited. But another argument I, I want to make about disalienation, um, you know, which remember has to do with sort of uh, disrupting and, and hopefully uh, repudiating some of the constructions of colonial identity that that exists um, among Europeans. Um, I think some of these practices come also from uh, other actors, right? So not from museums, but from those who who uh, pose challenges to them. Uh, and this is the case, uh, for example, of the Congolese activist, uh, Mwazulu Diabanza, who, uh, you know, in several incidents now has uh, basically had a crew to film himself taking objects from these various museums. 
Um, and what's interesting, of course, is that you know, by, by doing this, right, he, he is really exposing a fundamental problem for these museums, a kind of existential crisis. He's, ex he's exactly um, trying to get, you know, uh, France to admit that, that some of these things were taken uh, in um, extremely objectionable political circumstances. So by, by removing things, I mean, he doesn't actually get to remove them, right? He sort of lifts them off and then he's arrested. So it's not, and he also has no intention of actually really taking them away. Um, but the, the point is that in these trials, um, he has faced fines and, and different prison sentence, uh, but it's also raised, right? The, it, it's also disorienting to the audience. Uh, is he stealing or is he doing acts of restitution? Um, and I argue, well, you know, the problem with a lot of restitution when you look at it from a legal basis is the fact that colonialism was legal at the time. Also the problem that they often don't know the provenance of, of things, right? So a lot of the usual principles that are applied um, make restitution sort of findings difficult legally. Um, but I argue that actually the most productive thing about what he does is probably this, this fact of disalienation. He disrupts the usual narrative and so forces people to think about where these things came from and why they still are in the Louvre or, or in the, the possession of uh, the, these museums. Um, this alienation, of course, uh, also happens, I think, uh, through the ways that curators try to narrate uh, their exhibits. This is just an example from the Rijksmuseum, again, in Amsterdam, where, uh, you know, the, the Rijksmuseum is like a, a museum that um, tells the, the history of the Netherlands, 800 years of Dutch history. Uh, there are the Vermeer paintings, you know, there's lots of stuff about the Dutch Golden Age. Um, and yet, you know, now you do see in the exhibit, you know, sort of these more forthright uh, context, uh, you know, things. And, and I think, again, museums can do this as a way of trying to disalienate, you know, trying to explain Dutch history in a way that obviously incorporates more of uh, its problematic history uh, as a colonizing nation. I'm going to go a little bit faster because I realize, do I have like five more minutes? Sure, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, now, one thing I argue in the paper, though, is that obviously disalienation, there, there's promise because, uh, you know, through disalienation, you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, get people to face up to uh, confront a kind of reality of, of the self. Uh, and, and to contest a bit the positive self in, image they may have, uh, whether it's of the nation or of their place in, in the you know, hierarchy of civilizations, um, and, and then for them to be open to uh, reconstructing that in a more uh, basis that, that acknowledges uh, the problems of the nation uh, and also the, the problems of humanity. Um, but what's interesting to me is uh, as a cognitive affective experience. So what, what often happens in, in, in the process of disalienation is, is of course people can be resistant to it because people have built up their lives uh, and their whole sense of self-worth from having a certain view of themselves, you know, for example, from the having a view of the wonderfulness of Western values. Um, and so you see then the far right's reaction to disalienation uh, is, is to say that, um, you know, people who are, who are trying to, for example, complicate our, our national identity um, are creating oikophobia, this idea of fear of the home. You know, they want us to think that our, our home is terrible. Um, and so you see this kind of backlash. And, and I argue in the paper, I, I try to construct um, alienation as this cognitive affective experience or the psychoaffective experience um, that explains the emotive power of, of this backlash against um, movements uh, of disalienation, especially. Um, so, so I argue that this is something we have to also think about, right? When museums think about uh, contesting narratives and, and um, trying to assist in, in um, disalienation, they also could provide, or they should try to provide the space where people can reflect, um, but also uh, hopefully redefine their image of home and, and of themselves and others in relation to that home, uh, but also be aware that it's a very painful thing for a lot of people uh, and therefore they need to create space in a way that doesn't allow for this kind of deflection to happen. So what I think the far right is doing in a way is they're just trying to reassert a kind of structural domination, right? 
Um, and this is partly what I think the culture wars are about. They just want to say that we should unilaterally be able to impose our image of the home uh, on everyone, uh, including the subordinate position of, of those who now claim that you know, either this is their home or that home is not as nice as they, as we say it is. Um, but this politics is is really, to me, about the dominant group trying to um, retain their dominance or their capacity to um, determine without reciprocation uh, whose image of home will define an organized social political life. So it's a it's an act it's an active deflection, I think, of the pain that accompanies disalienation practice. Oh, and sorry, that was uh, Thierry Baudet from the Forum for Democracies Party uh, in the Netherlands. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to have to conclude, I think, very quickly with the second uh, practice then is, is that of non-alienation. So how can museums support the aim of reconciliation among contemporary agents that share a colonial past and also continually uh, exist in a structure of, of uh, structural injustice? How, how can museums assist in, in kind of the flourishing of non-alienated agents? And, and I mean, here in this as, in, as well as in some other papers I'm working on, I, you know, again, I wanna emphasize that non-alienation is a very difficult uh, regulative ideal, but I think it is an ideal that as Sadia Hartman um, put it, it is about trying to make possibility out of dispossession, right? So, so what are the possibilities once we already have had this experience of dispossession, of slavery and of genocide? Uh, and certainly some would argue that we still continue to exhibit, to um, be in social positions and practices where these things are still continuing and also future possibilities. So how do we think about museums as being able to help with this? And, and here again, I, I think to redress cultural misappropriation, it, it has to do with participation in museum practice. Uh, so you know, many museums now uh, try to engage and consult uh, with, with uh, different cultural groups, um, but I think consultation is probably not enough. There needs to be some active uh, participation um, but it also requires, I think, dismantling the center periphery dynamics of asymmetrical power uh, by dislocating the representational authority and knowledge away from modern museums uh, that have claimed them and have claimed to be the central representatives of humanity. So I think standpoint theory gives us um, a an, an way of trying to think about how actually, for example, uh, objects can be narrated differently, but also how they can be differently located. Um, and this is an example of the return of the Stone Cross of Cape Cross. Uh, Germany returned this, uh, I think, a, a year ago. Um, well, they returned it to the Namibian state. So what's interesting is Namibia now has, has a large maritime museum. Um, and this just gives you an idea of like how, you know, how this object has been exhibited in different ways. You know, it, 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 is, it is actually a, a Portuguese uh, stone cross uh, from the 15th century. And then when the Germans came and took over the area of, of what became German South West Africa, they actually took it with them. They took this cross and they built their own cross. And then, you know, their own cross sort of had this inscription about, you know, German glory and power. So it was all about, you know, colonial power contestations. And then it basically sat in um, a museum, I think in, in East Germany, and then it became part of the Deutsches Historisches Museum um, after reunification. Um, and, and so now Germany has returned this to Namibia so that it can be put in a, a narrative about you know, African uh, contact with Europe that led to colonization, genocide, as well as the introduction um, of Christianity. Um, so I, I argue here that non-alienation also has to do with decentering representation. And this obviously is going to require uh, more than what just a museum can do, but what states are willing to do to make this decentering possible. All right, so to conclude then, um, you know, my basic argument is that colonial museums cannot get to becoming museums about people without engaging in these anti-colonial and decolonial tasks. And the two that I've tried to outline with respect to addressing colonial alienation uh, are disalienation and, and non-alienation. Um, and uh, I think that museums can be sites of um, engagement with this unfinished project of decolonization uh, and that museums can assist in dismantling deeply entrenched international structural hierarchies of domination and oppression. 
uh, and that ultimately to do this, like to, to fashion our museums uh, and uh, the representation of humanity uh, in this way is, is really to decolonize ourselves, right? So, the, so I think it's a, it's a very important um, part that is not often thought about with respect to representation in, in politics. Thank you very much.